Hi, this is Mike Fauché, and today I'm really excited to talk about the FlashStore Pro 12-Bay All-Flash NAS Unit from ASUS Store. The FS6712X has a quad-core CPU and comes standard with a 10 gigabit network interface card and 4 gigs of DDR RAM, which is expandable. If you want to learn more about this unit and to see how it's configured, as well as how it performs, stick around for the rest of this video. And please don't forget to like and subscribe if you find this useful as it does help suggest the channel to others. As a person that generates a fair amount of data, I'm pretty particular about my storage. As I'm currently running several QNAP NAS units, an Unraid server, a TerraMaster NAS, a Synology NAS, and a TrueNAS server, speed and expandability are critical to me when evaluating a device. So I was thrilled when ASUS Store agreed to send me this device for a review. Though they did supply the device for a review, they haven't paid or influenced the video in any way, and my opinions, thoughts, and the results are my own. They'll see this for the first time just as you're seeing this. To set the stage as to why I'm excited about this device, I only use central storage approach on my home network, meaning no data from any user or computer is stored on any of the local machines. All user data and working files are stored to a NAS unit, so for me, speed is important. For archiving or backup and media storage, I use mostly traditional NAS units and Unraid due to the larger size and scalability. Because our storage demands always grow, the ASUS Store Flash Door Pro 12 really attracted my attention. Though this device comes in both a 6-bay as well as a 12-bay, which is the one I'm testing here, the 12-bay version is more appealing to me mainly because of the built-in 10 gigabit network card and the fact that it provides more future-proofing by having a total of 12 NVMe slots so I can keep adding drives as my needs grow. Let's quickly go over the specs. The NAS comes with an Intel Celeron N5105 quad-core 2 gigahertz CPU. It comes standard with 4 gigs of DDR RAM, but that is expandable to 16. And based on my testing, you'll probably want to add at least 4 more gigs of DDR to get the max out of this device. On this model, there are 12 M.2 drive slots and you can use optional heat sinks if you want them. It comes with a 90 watt power supply, but the device alone only uses about a max power of 26 watts. There's a built-in cooling fan to keep the drives cool with an incredibly low noise level of 18.7 dBs, making it ideal if you have this on your desktop, as it's probably quieter than most computers that you have close by. I have mine about three feet away and I can't really hear it. Next, let's see what comes in the box and go over the hardware, then set up the device for the first time. Inside you get a power supply, power cord, and a short CAT6A Ethernet cable, a quick start guide, and the device itself. Looking at the front of the unit, there's one USB-A 3.2 Gen 2 port capable of 10 gigabits in speeds. And moving to the back of the device, there's a SPDIF port for audio, two USB 2.0 ports, a 10 gigabit network port, and an HDMI port. The second USB 3.2 Gen 2 port, a reset button, and the power input. Let's take a quick look at where we load the 12 NVMe drives. The first six are actually loaded from the bottom. To do this, just remove the four screws on the bottom of the device and slide off the fan assembly. Here you can see the first NVMe slots numbered one through six. As you can see, there's a plastic clip to quickly mount the drives. To kick things off, I want to first install the first three drives. We'll configure the device with three drives and then test it to see how this device expands storage when we try to add a drive. Just slide the drives into the slot, push down, and the plastic clip will lock the drive into place. Once you're done, we can reinsert the fan assembly and put the four screws back in. As a note, you can put very thin heat sinks on these drives before, when you install them if you want to add additional coolant. Before we power up and configure it for the first time, let's take a quick look at where the second drives are located. To access the second six, remove the two screws from the back and simply slide the cover off, which will expose the second bank of six drives for a total of 12 NVMe drives. You can also see the dim slots, and this is where you can expand the storage from four gigs all the way up to 16. I would recommend that you have at least eight gigs for best performance. I found that the five transfer performance to be faster if you increase the amount of memory. 
Now that we have viewed the hardware, let's go ahead and set this thing up. Like all of the other NAS units, there's a couple different ways that you can get to the setup. One way is to just type the IP of the device into your browser and start the configuration. But if you're not comfortable with looking up your IP address, then just download and install the utility from a SUSE store onto your PC or Mac and run it. Once you have it installed, just run it. And once you're in the main screen, select scan and it'll scan your local network to find your NAS unit. Assuming that this is a new device, it will show up uninitialized. And if you click on it, it will launch into the setup. The first screen shows information about the device. Note that there's a warning at the bottom of the screen that M.2 drives need to be installed before you run the setup. Clicking on the next arrow prompts you to update to the latest ADM version if there is one, which I would always recommend that you do. After you click the next arrow, it's pretty well hands off and it will download and install the most current version of the operating system. Once it's done, it'll prompt you with the terms and conditions and after you've read them, check the accept at the bottom of and hit the arrow key. The next screen I thought was a nice touch compared to other manufacturers as it allows you to do a one-click setup or do a custom configuration if you're more experienced. I'm going to go ahead and pick the one-click setup so that we can see their implementation of Easy as well as to see what kind of defaults it configures in the device. Clicking the next arrow we get the first setup screen where we can give it a name and create our own admin account and password. We'll leave the balance setting, which is really a RAID 5 configuration for the storage requirements in this setup. My suggestion is if you're going to use more than five drives and you're really looking for maximum protection, then you can select maximum protection under that option, which creates a RAID 6 configuration and gives you up to two drives of redundancy and protection. In an SSD NAS unit like this, I don't want to use more than one drive of redundancy since total storage is a premium. But that's a choice that you're going to have to make based on how you use your NAS. I wouldn't use the max storage option as that does not provide any redundancy at all. The next option is to decide whether or not you want to use snapshots. If you're familiar with snapshots, snapshots reserve some amount of space on your storage device to perform a block copy at regular intervals. You typically give up 5-20% of your storage for the ability to easily restore your data to a previous state should something happen. It's a really nice and powerful feature, but again you have to decide how you're going to use your NAS and whether or not you can afford the spare space. I typically like snapshots. But for this example, we're going to go ahead and leave it at the default and leave them off. When you're done, hit the next arrow and it'll do initialization. Next is the account and registration. To use their features such as Easy Connect, you're going to need to create an account. As I've recommended in every other NAS review from any manufacturer, I don't use these native accounts to connect. They're very convenient and provide you some extra features. However, I prefer using something like Tailscale to log into my devices from outside. In my opinion, it's more secure and I can access everything on my network, not just the NAS unit. The least number of attack surfaces, the better. I'm going to select register later and hit the next arrow to continue the installation. Next, you'll be greeted with the privacy information where you can learn about how they treat your privacy. Or hit continue to move on to the next screen. This is the screen that I truly appreciate. Most of the users do not know that they're supposed to change the default ports. You actually have to agree to accept the default ports. I wish other manufacturers would do something like this. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to leave it as it defaults, as I want to see if it can be changed later from the control panel. Next, you'll be taken to the quick start page where you can skip or let it walk you through a few basic settings. You can select if you want to help in creating multiple users, and it will pause the guide and help you create a certain user. This is probably not that necessary, but I'll select it just for the heck of it. Click on start and you'll be guided through a short walkthrough on how to access certain functions. You can go through the rest of the guided tour and when it's done, you'll see a screen asking you if you need access to files through the Windows Explorer in which it'll show you how to access your device with the Windows Explorer. The next screen, it will ask you about accessing the devices outside your local network. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't use native services to connect, so I'm going to select no. You should now be taken to the desktop and you'll be able to access your device across your network. Just to provide a bit more foundation, let's go through some of the main features and settings of the device. There are way too many for one video, so post any questions or requests in the comments section on features that you'd like to learn more about. If you've used any other manufacturer's NAS before, 
you'll feel right at home as in many ways they're really similar. Let's start with the storage manager. Looking at the overview, we can see the volume and rate information, as well as which drive slots are currently being used. In the volume tab, we can see the current status of the volume. In the drive tab, we can see more specific information on the drives themselves. Now let's look at the access control panel where you can create additional users, and in the next tab, you can also create local groups. If there's enough interest, I'll do a separate video on users and groups. We'll skip down to the shared folders. It creates some default user folders so that each person has a folder on the NAS based on user, as well as public and web folders. To create your first shared folder, just click Add, give it a name and description. Under Volume, you can select a volume if you've created more than one. If you just set this NAS up and created this, you'll only have one volume. However, in the future, you'll have the option of expanding your storage by adding identical disks or creating entirely new volumes with separate disks. For example, I may want to add two or three more drives and create an encrypted volume. This is a topic in and of itself. So if you want to know more about it, let me know if there's any interest in creating a dedicated video on the topic. The next checkoff box determines whether or not you want this shared to appear when you browse your network. Below is whether or not you want to use the network recycle bin, and if you do, whether or not you want it to appear for each user or just the admin. The next screen determines the read and write access. You can choose between read and write for all users, read only for all users, pick a specific user, or a specific group if you created any. In the next screen, you can choose to enable the encryption if you want to encrypt this folder or just skip it. The last screen is a summary so you can review what you've just done and click finish when you're completed. Like most NAS units today, you have an app store. When we open App Central, we have to agree to their terms as well as the privacy statement. And once you've agreed, you're greeted with an option to install some of the pre-selected apps based on categories. You can click on a category and select the individual apps you want to install. You can go through each category or just skip it and search through the App Store yourself. They have a pretty good selection of stuff and they cover all the popular apps such as Plex, Docker, Nextcloud, just to name a few. Lastly, let's quickly look at the settings panel and go over what's available. Starting from the general tab, you can change or select the default ports and auto logout. Going across the top, you can customize the sign-in page. In the network section, you can customize your gateway and DNS settings as well as enable and disable IPv6. Under the regional settings, you can edit the date and time as well as the zone, time zones, and language. Going to hardware, you can alter some of the systems such as the LED, the buzzer, and the reset button, as well as to turn on and off the infrared receiver. Moving to fan control, you can change how the system fan behaves. Notifications allows you to set up and customize your notifications through SMS and or email. Under Easy Connect is where you can set up external access and allows you to create an ASUS Store ID if you didn't already create one. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I usually don't do this, so I won't go any deeper on this setting. Before we run some quick tests, let's see how easy it is to expand the storage. I added an additional one terabyte drive, and as you can see in the storage manager, it shows up as one inactive drive. Looking at the top tab, we can now see a management tab, and when you click on it, you're prompted with some options, one being the option to add a disk to this current volume. Make sure that's selected and hit next to continue and select the drive or drives that you're adding and hit next. Click finish on the next screen and it will begin to expand and resync your storage volume. And when it's done, it'll look something like this. Now that we've seen the hardware, the device and reviewed the settings, it's time to run a couple of benchmarks to see how this performs. I use my Windows 11 Core i9 and my Mac Studio for testing. I tested these devices using four 1TB SSDs in a RAID 5, and as I mentioned earlier, I upgraded the memory of the NAS to improve the performance. The file transfer speed with the default 4 gigs of RAM was much lower, and in my opinion, too low for a device like this. Adding the additional memory makes a huge difference in performance, and as you can see from the Windows file transfer, the performance writing to the NAS over a 10 gigabit network is saturating my network. This was done without any network tuning and using the standard MTU settings. Switching over to the Mac, I ran the Blackmagic disk test. Though this is not really a network-based benchmark, 
It does try to replicate how you would use the device for direct video editing or transferring of large files. Again, as you can see, the performance is extremely good. In summary, I really like this unit and I've used it as my daily driver since I received it. If you consider the number of expandable slots and the base price, this turns out to be a great value in flash storage. There is little to no competition for devices that have this many drive bays. Once you understand that you have to add more memory in order to extract the most from this device, the performance is fantastic and the drive configuration is really flexible. I do wish it was expandable past 16 gigs, as this would make a really solid foundation for a home server for such things as dockers and VMs, and having more than 16 gigs would be the next level. One feature I really did like is the noise. Though I have a lot of equipment in my office, almost all of it is virtually silent. During my testing, it never got loud and I never heard it even when it was running about two feet from me. And it was right next to me the entire time I recorded this video. Because I didn't have 12 MVME drives to load this up, I couldn't test it when it was fully loaded. But if four drives is any indication, it won't alter the noise level very much, if at all. This was my first ASUS Store NAS that I set up and I used but it won't be my last. I really like the OS and it has all the features that I use in my NAS devices in addition to the flexible storage options. I really want to thank the team at ASUS Store for providing this device and for making this review possible. Well, that's about it for today's video. Make sure you post any questions or feedback in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe for other content like this. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.